Members, you're welcome to the meeting. Um, can we proceed to the agenda? Item one uh, is in relation to apologies. Uh, is there any apologies? No. Okay. Item two, uh, declaration of interest. Can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting. Uh, does any member have any interest to declare? Okay, thank you. Then item three, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of June. Uh, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of June were agreed under the provisions of Standing Order 1159 and the link uh, to the agreed minutes is available at page 10 on today's meeting <coughs> part. Agreed? Q. Item four, matters arising. Uh, the paper at 4.1, which is pages 8 to 10 of the Members' Pact, outlines the decision made <coughs> under a temporary standing order 1159 since the committee last met, and will ask members to note the paper and that the decision will now be formally recorded in the minutes of proceedings for, from today's meeting. And can we also advise members that the other matters arising from the minutes of the last meeting will be covered elsewhere on today's agenda. Then if we could move into the items of business, and that is item five, which is the review of the statement of entitlements for an official opposition. And can I refer members to the Secretariat briefing paper and the draft terms of reference at item 5.1, which is pages 12 to 18 of the members pack. And I'll ask the clerk if he wants to speak to this particular item and then if members could indicate if there's any questions that they want to ask. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you. So, Chair, members will be aware that on the 13th of October the Assembly passed a resolution referring this matter to the ARC committee and to agree a, 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 a terms of reference in, in jointly with the Assembly Commission. And, uh, that, uh, that the terms of that motion are set out on, on page 12 of the of the pack. Um, arising from that, um, the Secretariat of Liaise with the Secretary of the Commission to draft this uh, background paper in terms of reference, um, just the first draft, and that's attached at the um, at the paper. So once this committee <coughs> agrees that, then it would go to the Assembly Commission for consideration agreement before the uh, further steps would be taken in terms of the review. So I'll just um, take members through the paper. Um, so the, the first, uh, up to paragraph really nine, is just background on, on the NDNA and the, the statement of entitlements and how that has been implemented to date uh, in Assembly standing orders and uh, other administrative processes. Um, the, the terms of reference proper uh, starts at, at paragraph 12 of the paper on page 15 of the pack. So, and this has just been drafted simply to align with the terms and the wording of the paragraph 3.7 of Annex C to the NDNA and the terms of the Assembly's resolution. So um, there may be aspects that the committee wants to add for more detail. Um, and, and, for example, uh, uh, you know whether the committee wants to specify any consultation that needs to be take place with with uh, parties in the assembly, or or that that, that hasn't been specified as uh, in this draft. Um, so, so, so the uh, I'll just draw members' attention to some aspects. Perhaps uh, paragraph thirteen refers to the appointment of the appropriate independent person is referred to to undertake the review. So the thinking here was that um, a, a list of uh, suitable persons would be drawn up by assembly research um, and that would be provided to the committee and to seek a committee agreement, uh, ideally consensus on, on the list uh, of individuals and then that would allow uh, tenders to be sought and, and someone to be appointed from that list. And I suppose in terms of in terms of the individuals that would be identified for that list, the criteria like, for example, um, that the persons have undertaken similar reviews of, of this nature of, of, of uh, inter-parliamentary affairs on, a, on a, an independent, non-partisan basis, um, that they have a, a knowledge, detailed knowledge of assembly, uh, parliamentary procedure, um, and also that they would have experienced 
experience of managing or assessing fi finances uh, in, a, in a parliamentary context, th those would appear to be the kind of uh, key areas in terms of criteria for getting onto the list uh, for for uh, invites for ten for tender. Then, um, I suppose subsequent stage in terms of um, evaluating tenders would be uh, maybe around the methodology and obviously the price pricing uh, aspects as well. But that was the thinking in terms of how they how the appropriate person would be identified <coughs> and then and then uh, selected. Um, then uh, just to there, there's one issue the committee will also need to consider paragraph 16 around the timetable so uh, you know if the committee wishes to set a, a deadline for the production of the report and provision of that to the committee um, members may have, have some views around that in terms of what would be uh, what would be, would, would be applicable. And then after the, the independent person would report, produce a report and provide that to the committee, then the uh, committee itself would, would uh, prepare its report to the, to the Assembly as, as per the, the Assembly resolution of 13th of October. So that's really just a quick skip through the draft as it, as it, as it stands. Chair, I'm happy to take any okay. questions. Can you members? just clarify a couple of things, Shane? One, is it implied that the person who would be appointed to conduct the review would of necessity be able to contact either A, other committees in the Assembly and B, uh, parties in the Assembly? Or do we need to include that so that it's that while we, we may think that it is assumed that that is the case, to ensure that that would take place, that you know there was a, there was a, a reference made to, given the fact that you want to ensure that everybody who has the opportunity to be involved in this is involved and obviously there are parties who have a particular interest and it would only be out of uh, you know, courtesy of, of, of nothing else that they would have the opportunity to be able to engage with that process. Yeah. Chair, the, the, the committee may wish to specify something in that regard. Um, as I say, in drafting this, it's just really uh, I followed the, the the wording in the NDNA and the, and the resolution, but to ensure that that takes place, uh, the committee may wish to include something in and, there. And two other things, just simply a time, whether or not we want to put a time frame, two months, three months, uh, for the for a, a return of a, uh, a a report, and then is there a cap in relation to the cost? So have we got a budget? And the the final thing is that in relation to the list of potential persons who would carry this out, I think if, if I pick up what you're saying is that it is better that we have a list that would be brought to this committee and this committee then agrees that list and from that list there is then a procurement process that would appoint one of those persons. Because if, if a list came to us and there was somebody on it for, for some reason that we uh, there was a, 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 an issue with, I think it's better for it to be identified at that stage as opposed to there being a process and someone being appointed and then there becomes a problem. We want to try and have this as, as, as painless and as streamlined as we possibly can. Yeah, sure. That was... So, just on those various points, um, I've consulted with the procurement office in the assembly. So, the rules require if if, if the cost is between five thousand and thirty thousand uh, pound, three tenders are required. So, um, a list could be drawn up by assembly research, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 taking into account those criteria I mentioned earlier. Um, the availability of the, the individuals could be checked out first. And then the committee could consider that list and agree they, that, that everyone's content with the individuals on the list, and then the tenders could be sought uh, from those individuals. Um, Chair, in terms of the point about the, the timetable, the deadline, the committee could add in as well if it wants, you know, a progress update at a certain point in time after after the, the commencement of the review as well. Okay. Robbie? Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Ian, for, for the paper. 
Um, I we had sort of indicated through, for my party that this would be, would be one of our most important pieces of work to see being undertaken. So then the chair has alluded probably to everything that, that, that I want to speak to. So um, with regard to the consultation, I think it should be um, not implied, but it should be explicit that, that certainly parties and committees are part of that consultation process um, and to ensure that the smaller parties and independents are encapsulated in that in, in terms of the, the breadth of the scope of what opposition could be uh, and all the, the, the myriad of um, things that, that, that pertains to. The um, timetable, again, I think it's we've got 16 months of this mandate left. Um, uh, is, it, uh, is it possible that it, this could be delivered in this mandate so that in the second mandate um, a reviewed um, package for opposition is available uh, and ready to go? Um, that might sh sharpen uh, politics here a, a, a little bit, and that's the, the timetable piece would be pretty pretty important. And the, the chair's uh, last piece there, I thought, was actually uh, was was pretty important. So what I wouldn't like to see is that um, when the when the, the bids come in for, for it, that we get stuck or stymied at the, at the last stage. So we can agree as much up front with regard to who who would be taking on the role, um, and the timings would just be particularly important. I think. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair, 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 just a bit can yeah, add, just sorry, to add that the, in terms of the procurement exercise, the committee could agree that it's content with the list of individuals and then that the actual request for tenders and selection is done at official level with advice from the procurement office, or it could decide that you know representatives from the committee are involved in that selection exercise and sc scoring the tender and so forth. So either of those two approaches would be would be feasible. So it's it's, it's you know it's up to the committee in that regard, but. Okay. Jerry? This is the follow on, maybe from a couple of those uh, uh, points. Um, in, in terms of uh, Robbie's uh, point around the time frame, uh, it, it makes sense, obviously, to have it done this uh, mandate. I'm just wondering does that bring the date forward um, because of the process it has to go through? So it has to come to us, I presume, but then uh, does it have to go to uh, the Commission? Uh, if you're coming to some sort of conclusion on it. Um, so the end of mandate I'm happy with, but you need to consider that, that part of it. So do you, need, do you need the review at a certain period, maybe after six months or whatever, to see, to see where we're going on it or whatever? You know, it might be a bit more sensible. We're trying to do it. Uh, I think it's sensible to do it uh, by the end of the mandate so that we're looking at something in the next mandate. The other wee thing um, around the selection of uh, or the list. <coughs> I'm, I'm just presuming because, as you pointed out yourself, Chair, I can't see the circumstance, but if there's a circumstance where there's an objection to it, I presume there would have to be uh, legal or yeah. some sort of guide around what that would be, as opposed to, I just don't like the look of the guy. Yeah. You know? um, so I'm presuming there is something, or is it, I suppose the question is, Jane. So the list comes in, the officials bring in the list, we either say yeah or nay, but if we say nay, that there has to be some, I presume, like any uh, process like that there, they would want to be feedback or somebody would say, well, why was I not allowed on the list? Yeah, Chair, it's, it's something I can look into, but uh, I think that when I, when I discussed it with the procurement office, they were content that the committee decides who's on the list um, and it, it, that as long as, you know, the committee can, can make a decision in that regard and... and uh, I didn't get into details in terms of if, if objections are, are, are raised against individuals on what basis that can stand, but um, you know I can look into that. And can, can I expand on a slight issue? But, um, in, in terms of the list, then is is the list uh, will, there, will the list appear without approaching any of the people? I suppose that's the question. Because if people are are approached, then they know they're on the list. Therefore, they have uh, they have rights to do some. If there's a list, just a list that you're looking at and trying to maybe bring it down to a short list or something like that, I think that's a different rule. So, so it, both of those approaches are feasible. So a, a list could be produced of, say, 12 individuals or 10 individuals based on those criteria I mentioned about people with experience of undertaking these types of reviews, knowledge of proce uh, parliamentary procedure, experience of of um, assessing finances in the parliamentary context, those types of uh, criteria. So research could produce that list. That list could be brought to the committee and no, no contact made with those individuals initially. And the committee then agree uh, the, the individuals to be, to be invited to tender. The, the, I suppose the issue there is that 
some of, some of those individuals may not be interested or in a position to tender. Um, the other approach could be to that the procurement office approaches those uh, initial list and, and, deter and establishes who's available and interested to tender, and then that uh, shortened list, if you like, is brought to the committee. So there's, there's okay. those two approaches are, are, are open to the committee. I'm going to bring in uh, Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, can I just double check on this? I'm quite uncomfortable with um, people creating a list of people who they know. Um, surely this is a PQQ type process where there's pre qualify pre um, qualifying questionnaire goes out to people, and they are then entitled to put their name forward. Um, if they so wish to do so or they're interested in that contract. Um, I'd rather that it was done in a more open and transparent way than, than asking staff at the assembly to pull together a list of people that they know because there may well be somebody who's come onto the scene more um, recently, um, a postgraduate, a PhD student, or um, could even be somebody outside of Northern Ireland that may be interested in this. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask was the paper that we have in front of us at the moment doesn't currently include any reference to the Assembly and Executive Reform Assembly Opposition um, Bill. Didn't that go through? It's just, um, it would be quite important that the person considers what has already been agreed, agreed by the Assembly and is in place. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes, sure. Sure, just on that latter point, there, there is, um, there's something in, in a paragraph 14. Uh, so that was the 2016 Act, um, <coughs> and yeah. the, the, there there is provision there to, to for the review to take account of. So the background to this was that the the statement of, of entitlements was was implemented through standing orders and administrative procedures. There is the 2016 Act in place there, which has has provisions which haven't been implemented. Uh, the Previous review, uh, the previous um, procedures committee started a review of the 2016 Act <coughs> that wasn't concluded. So, um, so that's the position to date. Um, so, yeah. C can you just deal with that issue that Kelly raised in relation to the PQQ? No. Chair, so. I, I can take further advice from the procurement office on this, and if the committee wanted to go out with a, you know, take the approach of an expression of interest approach. But the advice I got to date was that given the likely cost of this, um, the, the, the procurement process it can apply is it's a, a three tender exercise. And research would be looking at this from the point of view of identifying individuals according to certain criteria, you know, uh, and providing a, a, a list of, of potential um, candidates. So. Okay. Jim? Yeah, just on the point about appointment, a you're suggesting that the ultimate selection of the person to be appointed will be by procurement staff. Is that correct? Well, Chair, it could be. The committee could delegate it to to the secretary officials, or um, it could decide that it wants to be engaged in the selection process itself. And uh, you know, representatives of the committee could be on the, on a yes. panel, which would which would score the tenders and and select the successful bidder. Because. If it's left to procurement, it will just be decided on a cheapest option, or not? Well, Chair, the, the, there's, there would be value for money uh, considerations. That, so there could be criteria around experience, methodology, and price, or, or any combination. You know, in terms of assessing the bids. Um, I think it would be better, Chair, if this committee had some representation on the selection panel. Uh, do you think that would be preferable? Um, and then we'd have some ownership of it, um, which might be a protection for the person selected as well. <laughs> um, do these terms of reference give the appointee the right for example, when they review the 2016 Act, to say, well, in fact, an amendment of that in this regard would be helpful, or are they hamstrung by what the parameters of that legislation is? I suppose that, that, really determined, that, that could be determined by us. 
as to the latitude that there is for the individual. That was the point I was making earlier in relation to, you know, have the, the, the latitude to be able to speak to you know, parties or individuals or whatever uh, beyond uh, what, what's set out. Yeah, sure. And uh, I'm just looking at paragraph 14 to see if, <coughs> if, if that provides that latitude to the, ind to the independent person or whether the committee would want to well, amend that. Anyway. I think you could read 14 that the only latitude is in respect of the adequacy of the statement of entitlements and that you might need a little more latitude in, in context of the standing orders and the legislation. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought that needs to be widened. So we could, if, if, if that was the case, we could get a, a wording that would expand 14 slightly. Yep. Members be happy enough with that? Yep. Jerry? Yep. Yep. Sorry, sorry, Jim, are you finished? Uh, no, sorry. I'm not finished. Uh, on paragraph 12, <coughs> if I read the, the relevant paragraph in New Decade New Approach correctly, it's not just addressing the uh, statement of the adequacy of the statement of entitlements of the official opposition. It's also addressing additional funding to parties who form the opposition, which could be wider than a single party. So is paragraph 12 reflective of that? Gene? Uh, and just just picking up on that, Chair, I'm also looking at page 17, uh, paragraph 4 of the Statement of Entitlements, which at that time picked up on the financial aspects as well. Well, that was about a rather impossible dream of it all being cost neutral, I would have thought. Is that not what 17.4 is about? Um, but the point I'm making is we're asking this independent person to report on more than the adequacy of the statement of entitlements. We're asking them, aren't we, to, to explore the additional funding for parties in opposition. At least that's what New Decade New Approach seems to say, but that seems to have been diminished in para 12 by saying should explore the creation of additional funding for the offices of the leaders of opposition parties. That's not what New Decade New Approach says. It says the parties recognise the additional funding should be available to parties who form the opposition. Why is it being diminished to only the offices of the leaders of opposition parties? when New Deck and New Approach was about funding for the parties. Yeah. So just going back to, um, it's just the wording in New, Deal, New Deck and New Approach at paragraph one on page yep. 13. Yep. <coughs> Very first sentence, the parties recognise additional funding should be made available to parties who form the opposition. Paragraph 12, it only looks at additional funding for the leaders. That's right, yeah. That was discussed at New Decade, New Approach, and it wasn't for the leaders. So and could, the, the, at paragraph 12 just takes the last sentence of paragraph 1. Yeah, but it doesn't take the first sentence. So if it included the first sentence, then it would it be a more accurate reflection of NDA? Let's, let's just agree that they're, they're what it says in the NDA, NDA and, and put it in. Yeah, it was paper. Which is the easiest way. Yep. Not here to change. Oh. So, the easiest way of doing it. Yes. Yep. Shane? Yeah, just, it's, it's just getting the, the wording agreed here, Chair. You know, uh, but if we replicate what's in NDA and A then and put it into 12, then that covers it should explore the creation of additional funding for parties uh, who form the opposition, including then the last sentence, which is about uh, additional funding for the officers yeah. of the leaders. Yeah. Are we happy enough for that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And else, Jim? No, thanks. Yep.
Alec, and then Jerry. Yeah, it's just the, the tender process for the person, um, whoever's chosen, is... I, I, I would agree with Kelly. I'm, I'm not quite happy about just a list being thrown in front of us and us having to decide who goes forward. Um, <coughs> I, I would like to see that been broadened out, if possible. OK. okay. Jerry? My, my instinct in this uh, is, to, is to agree with Kelly as well. Um, because we have to stand over this, and uh, the more open it is, the better. However, uh, and it's a small however, uh, I want to return to the Rob, Rob's point about how long we have to deal with this, because people want this sorted out. I presume everybody wants it sorted out in this mandate, and therefore we need to bring it down. So you're talking in, in sense about an internal or and or an external. Um, like I suppose if you about the policing board, it would go out um, on an advertisement and all of that, and there are certain periods that you need for doing, doing all of that. Uh, but I think it is, it is the safest way um, to do it, and the one that we can stand over. And I'm also of an instinct to agree with uh, Jim in terms of uh, <coughs> members of the, of, the, of the committee being on the panel, because it gives a, a waiter rather than it being because that's open. You have to, you know, you have to do go through your matrix. You have to do the scoring. Um, people can get feedback and all of that. My only way in all of it is the yeah, the next mandate. So if we can, if we can get that in, and we and we can, <coughs> if we can get it in, but we have to plan then on the basis of that. Of course, the the mandate. you take it and you approach anticipated all of this been done in six months. I'm not sure that's realistic. Uh, but should we not in our own heads? sort of work backwards and say, well, if by the end of June we had this report, um, when then do we need to... Like, at the end of June would give us enough time, yes. wouldn't it, oh, to process yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So does that mean you afford the person three months? Yeah. Uh, four months? Yeah. Um, if, but, I mean, whatever works. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's so, if, if we are agreed that we needed this mandate, and I think we are yeah. better, then. So, are we are we saying to try and get a sense of this that we go to a, an open tender process, we invite people to uh, to bid. There is then a panel set up, which is a combination of both the secretariat and members of this committee. Person is appointed. And they're given at least three months yeah. to produce a report, and the time frame that we would like, what we're aiming for, is this being finished with us, so that we can recommend it to the assembly by no later than June. Great. Uh, is that a, a Kelly? I'm br going to bring Kelly in. You're on mute. Just hold on. I want to Sorry go. about that. I just wanted to say, um, is three months enough? Would it need to be four months? Are we allowing this person to consult over eight weeks or 12 weeks? Because if it's 12 weeks, then that's the three months gone um, to give them time to pull that together. It may need to be four months to be more realistic. OK, well, I, like I'm in the hands of the committee. I, I think if it's four months, we then need to really get it moving ASAP. You know, so by the end of this year, we need to have that process well and truly underway, which I think we still have time to be able to do, uh, provided we get the terms of reference agreed by the Commission, and then that, that means that we have a provisional date for a meeting in December that we could finalise this and get it uh, out uh, for that process. If Gerald, sure. it, it makes sense, sorry, it makes sense um, to do that. I, I, I then, and it's all to do with time, and if you look at the latitude, and, and there was a, a wide, a fairly wide view of what latitude is, and I'm just, it's a question or a, a comment, then does that affect the latitude? Or, or does the time actually, whoever the person is, they then work out what the latitude is then? Because time will certainly limit if you're talking about all committees, if you're talking about all of that. So maybe it's not a big, maybe it's not a big issue. I'm just, I just pointing it out is, you know, if you wait in the latitude, if we wait in the latitude, it's different. If we leave it up to the person, maybe yeah. the fact that they have to bring it in within uh, three, four months is going to, is going to deal with the issue. Yeah. I'm going to bring in Jonathan Buckley. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I, by and large, in, uh, agree with the process that you have set out there after some of the scrutiny by members. But I, I would concur with Kelly's point. I think it's much more favourable to, to look towards a four-month model uh, to ensure that the evidence gathering process is given for for in due process. So I, I would agree with that comment alongside the other elements in which you have outlined in, in your statement. Okay. Any other vice chair? Yes, yes to the Chair, I'd comment too that uh, I think the slowest part of this process is probably in our hands uh, and that if we get to the actual appointment in itself, that uh, that can be expedited in many respects by the person who takes on that responsibility, uh, but that um, uh, what, what might just slow the whole thing down is how it is that we, even as a committee and the likes of it, uh, sort of approach us and ensuring that someone is uh, appointed as quickly as possible in that respect. Okay, if we can try and so are we with the let, let's deal with the terms of reference first. So we get uh, so with the changes that we had agreed, are we happy uh, or do because we want to try and get this back to the commission so that they agree the terms of, of reference. Yeah. So, see what way do you want Chair, to... Chair, just given that there's a few amendments to be made here, one approach would be for the committee to agree to agree this understanding order 1159. So I, I can make these amendments, mm -hmm. send out the draft, and, and the members can give it okay. a deadline to respond. Um, if, yep. if members are content. Yep. Just, just in order to enable me to do that as well, does the committee want something included specifically to re requiring the independent person to consult with the parties yes. and, and independent members represented in the assembly and, yep. Yep. and other bodies, for example, the procedures committee and the commission? Yeah. And Agreed. So just secondly, Chair, um, do, do, do you, does the committee want any provision in for a progress update to be provided or at a certain point within the four months? Or? Well, can I just Jim? go back on the previous point? Like, we're bringing in an independent person to get some independent thought on this. Do we really want to bog him down on regurgitating what we all think from our different perspectives? If he's an independent person, it's not better to... I'm pretty unfettered. Yeah, he can consult, but I wouldn't like to see that become the no. main focus of his work. No, no, because it sort of undermines the independence. Yeah. You you know, but I think equally, you have to ensure yeah, that he, they yeah. are aware that they can consult with others mm. in this, uh, you know, in these institutions. So yeah. it's a combination. It's not a case of either or. It's a combination of both. Mm. In fairness, I think maybe the important thing is to try and cover all of that because there are committees and all of that there, but there are people on committees. So if it's with members, and something uh, might help us, if it's with members of the assembly, then you've covered it. So, yeah. so it doesn't stop going to committees and all of that there. Yeah. But if you open it up to all the members, then he can make his choices in yeah. terms of that. Okay, with that in relation to terms of reference, are we agreed? As a, as a way to deal with it. Secondly, then, in terms of the, I'm sure nobody was logging in on this other, uh, the issue of the procurement. Are we uh, agreed as to the way that we outlined earlier that that would be the way go for a tender process, uh, a panel, and a selection? Done. Chair, I can bring f a bag of paper after getting further advice from the procurement office on how that can be done for, okay. the, for the next meeting. Then, whenever, whenever the uh, after, after the commission has considered the okay. terms of reference, and we're there's a provisional date of the 15th of December, uh, so that we're all close up to Christmas for that date of of this committee meeting. So we could, if we could, use that as a date for us to make that decision, then that will start the process. Yep. Agreed? Yep. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Nobody else want to make any comment? Jerry? You had to ask a last question, but uh, at ten, up here. <laughs> <laughs> a number of times here it's been said that, you know, this is a, a joint, there's been a joint process between ourselves and the Commission. Yes. Is there, is there anything that we've agreed there which interferes with that, or are we okay? Sorry, Chair. Yeah, the, so the joint part is to agree the terms of reference. After the terms <coughs> of reference is agreed by the Commission, then it's over to this committee. Yeah. That's right. Just to clarify, interest, I'm on the Commission as well. So. And that's okay. Well. Noted. So you're aware of this conversation. So. <laughs> I'll take it back to the Commission. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, item number 
six uh, members, which is the research briefing on institutional review. Uh, and this is to the comparative research paper on institutional review committees, and that's at pages 20 to 28 of the members' pack, which was agreed, uh, which it was agreed would be commissioned, and which members noted at the last meeting of the uh, 24th of June. And could I ask Assembly uh, Broadcasting to bring Ray uh, McCaffrey into spotlight, please? Is Ray there? Yes, yes there he is. Ray, carry on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, the briefing paper itself uh, is short, so I'll run through the, the key points. Um, the research was asked to identify, uh, if possible, committees and other legislatures with a similar remit to that of ARC. So it looked at the Welsh Parliament, a Scottish Parliament, House of Commons, House of Lords, and Doyle Aaron. It then also goes on to discuss recent external reviews that were undertaken in respect of the Scottish Parliament and National Assembly for Wales, uh, as it was then known. And I'll talk about those reviews um, just briefly later in the presentation. Uh, so, Chair, to begin with, uh, I suppose it's useful to say up front that there are no directly comparable committees to ARC in the other legislatures in the UK and Ireland. And I suppose that's perhaps not entirely surprising, uh, given that ARC sort of was born from the, the St Andrews Agreement and sort of sits within that the constitutional framework of agreements and legislation that, that are specific to Northern Ireland. Um, but there are committees that carry out similar work at TARC, uh, and I suppose these can be broadly classified in, into two categories. Uh, committees that deal with constitutional issues and committees that deal with legislation or, or legislative review. So I'll, I'll identify those committees in each legislature and highlight key areas of work uh, that may relate to the work of, of ARC. Um, so turning first to the Welsh Parliament and the Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee, uh, with its remit to consider any other matter relating to legislation, justice and constitution within or relating to the competence of the Senate or the Welsh ministers, including the, the quality of legislation. Uh, and figure one in the paper lists examples of inquiries undertaken by the committee. Uh, and as members can see, it, it's quite a broad body of work. Um, it includes the UK government's proposals for further devolution to Wales, disqualification of membership from the National Assembly for Wales, uh, along with a few areas of work related to Brexit. Um, still within the Welsh Parliament, there is also the Committee on Senate Electoral Reform, which was established uh, as a result of uh, a recommendation from the expert panel on Assembly Electoral Reform. Um, and again, the Committee's current inquiries include uh, the capacity of the Senate, uh, which means the number of members, uh, electing a more diverse Senate and electoral systems and boundaries. Uh, turning next to the Scottish Parliament, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee um, has recently published reports uh, relating to aspects of electoral reform in Scotland, uh, including electoral registration and length of terms for Scottish parliamentary elections and Scottish local government elections. Uh, in the House of Commons, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee has a remit to examine constitutional issues, the quality and standards of administration provided by civil service departments, and the reports of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. And some of the recent uh, and ongoing work actually of the committee includes the work of the Cabinet Office, proposals on voter engagement, voting by convicted prisoners, and a report entitled The Minister and the Official, The Fulcrum of Whitehall Effectiveness. Uh, and similarly, the House of Lords Constitution Committee has as part of its remit. Uh, it undertakes investigative inquiries in the wider constitutional issues. Uh, and members can see in figure three of the paper some examples of its work, uh, for example, the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, the legislative process, and in 2017 it undertook a review of judicial appointments. Um, turning to Doyle Aaron, the subcommittee on Doyle reform was tasked with looking at ways the role of the Doyle could be strengthened, uh, and this was in the context that the Doyle had historically been perceived uh, as being a relatively weak scrutiny body. Um, and back in May 2016, the committee produced a report that made a, a number of recommendations in respect of how the Doyle's uh, scrutiny functions could be enhanced. Uh, and these are set out in figure four uh, of the paper. Uh, and just staying with the Doyle briefly, one further example is the Joint Committee on the Eighth Amendment, 
which was tasked with consideration uh, of the Citizens' Assembly recommendation on replacing Article 40.3.3 of the Constitution uh, with the constitutional provision to allow the Oireachtas to legislate on the issue of abortion. So that's really sort of looking internally uh, at committees uh, within the legislatures. And we do see there that while there's not a directly comparable committee to ARC, there are areas of work that, that um, for example, ARC would have touched on in the past. So I'd just like to discuss the recent external reviews of the, the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Parliament. These were independent of the institutions, but I do think they provide uh, useful context as they address similar topics to those considered um, by ARC uh, in the past. So beginning with the Commission on Parliamentary Reform in Scotland, um, this was tasked with examining how the Parliament could more effectively engage with citizens and how its work could be improved to deliver better scrutiny. Uh, its report was published in June 2017 and addressed a broad range of issues, uh, including uh, the effectiveness of committees, effective use of chamber time, Parliament's role in supporting diversity, a greater variety in chamber business and party discipline and committees. Um, and in response, the presiding officer of the, the Scottish Parliament established the presiding officer's advisory group to oversee delivery of the report's recommendations. Um, and these were sort of uh, outsourced and referred to a number of bodies within the Parliament to take forward. And similarly, in February 2017, the presiding officer of the National Assembly for Wales announced the establishment of an expert panel on assembly electoral reform to provide robust, politically impartial advice on a range of issues, including the number of members the assembly needs, uh, the most suitable electoral system, and the minimum voting age for assembly elections. Uh, and then its report published uh, in December 2017, the panel addressed a broad range of issues uh, related to those key aspects, uh, including the size of the Assembly, uh, extension of the Assembly's working week, support and resources available to members, uh, cross-party groups, legislative scrutiny, capacity of the committee system, including structure and membership, uh, and of course the Assembly's electoral arrangements and voting age. <clears throat> um, the Committee on Senate Electoral Reform, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, was tasked with taking forward a number of recommendations contained in the report. And that committee published a detailed report in September of this year, which made further recommendations for consideration uh, and essentially endorsing a lot of what the expert panel had said, for example, increasing the number of members to between 80 and 90 and developing a, a systematic and proactive uh, approach to assessing and communicating the impact of the, the scrutiny and oversight work carried out by the Senate and its, its committees. Uh, so members, that, that's a, a brief run through of the, of the paper, as I say, the bottom line is that there's no directly comparable committee in other legislatures, but um, we can see that um, both within legislatures and in the two external reviews, um, similar topics or similar areas of work have been addressed uh, to those that ARC would have carried out over the, the past couple of mandates. Um, so, Chair, I'm happy to, to attempt to answer any questions that members may have. Hey, thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll all be pleased to know that we're unique. Uh, no, no, <laughs> No surprise in that. Uh, any member, any question in relation to the paper? Although I do think the paper is very, very useful for the next item that we're going to uh, speak on in regards to our work programme. Any questions that any member has for Ray? No? That was very good. No? Okay, thank, no. Thank you. thank you for a very good and very comprehensive paper. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. you. Chair, do I just uh, have to go to 145? Yes, well, we'll try if we can. And, and I know there's another couple of members who have another, so we will. That brings us to item seven, which is the committee work programme. And that is at pages 30 to 46 in the members' pack. I'll ask Shane to briefly uh, speak to this, and then we have maybe. Sure. A... Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. He's, tra he's trying Apologies. to get in Apologies. with your question to Ray, but he's gone now, has he? Yes, I think he has. No, no, he's still there. Sorry, it's just quickly, Ray. Was there any other legislatures that you looked at outside the British Isles that potentially draw some direct cor cor or correlation with the work of the ERC? Uh, no, this this particular research didn't didn't look beyond um, the UK. It was essentially updating a research paper from 2016, so I wanted to um, sort of stick to the the same format. 
Okay, so there, is there, has there ever been any work carried out in relation to other legislatures around the world that potentially use this as a model? In particular, I think maybe even on maybe state-like basis in the United States, for example, is there anything there that we can draw direct co course or correlation with? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any directly comparable committees, I have to say, um, but it's something I can I can um, go away and look at in more detail if the committee waste. I think I think it would be something that would be useful. You know, obviously, a lot of what you have outlined in your report is something that uh, was known to many of us in terms of those structures within the other legislatures within the, the British Isles. But looking for their fail, we might potentially find something that we can uh, use as best practice. But I'm not saying it's out there, but it's certainly something worth exploring. Okay, Ray, will you be happy to do that and just bring an addendum to to the report? Yes, Chair, of course, no problem. Okay, members content? Yeah. I hope, I hope uh, members not suggesting that maybe if there was such a committee that the committee would go and visit such a uh, facility in the United States. Maybe that is that not why the members ask or no? Do you well, turn that? With <laughs> restriction, we might have to do a Zoom call. <laughs> okay, thank you. And apologies for not uh, saying that you, you were wanting to get in. So if everybody's content in that item, then we'll move to item seven, which is the committee work programme, we'll ask Shane to, to speak to that. Thank you. Yes, Chair, uh, page 30 of the pack. So members will recall that the committee agreed to write out to the party leaders and independent members to, uh, of the Assembly for views on potential topics for the committee's work programme. Um, six parties have uh, responded to date, and the, there's a summary of the responses in the table at Appendix A, and also the full responses are attached to Appendix B. Um, so it, it's really, I suppose, for members to consider which of any of the topics that they would like to consider for, for taking forward, um, bearing in mind some of the submissions from the parties were, were received prior to the committee, uh, for, prior to the Assembly referring the uh, review of the statements of entitlements to, to the committee. So, so the, the issue of opposition, uh, will, will, will procedural and funding arrangements at least, will be, will be picked up uh, uh, as part of that review. So. It's really just for, for members' initial consideration. There, there's some of these areas, Chair, I think overlap with, with, for example, the work of the Procedures Committee and also I know the CLG, uh, Chairperson Liaison Group, is, is looking at the issue of uh, rising from the RHI inquiry about, um, about uh, recommendations in relation to statutory committees. So, so there may be a need to scope out, you know, where, the, where there's overlap, what falls properly within the remit of this committee, and so forth. So, just bearing that in mind, it, it's it's for members' uh, initial consideration. This stage they could either, I suppose, shortlist from 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 this list at this point, or uh, we could agree that that scoping and feasibility work is done first. Uh, Chair, okay. So. What I was for suggest, members, and it's not in any way to to curtail uh, views of members, but. Bear in mind there is an issue in relation to, to time. That if we take, and I think there's 15 recommend or 15 suggestions in the topics, and we have the paper uh, that Ray has given to us in relation to other uh, legislatures. If we were to ask uh, the, the clerk to do a paper which basically sifts out of those 15. Uh, what already is being covered, duplicated, provided for, uh, and we also allow ourselves as members until the 4th of December if there is any other issue that we think should be put on that, that list for consideration. At the meeting on the 15th of December, then we will at least have a more definitive list to determine what it is we would want to focus in on. I just think that would give us, uh, we have a relative degree of information, but some of it, as Shane has already said, is covered in other pieces of work that's been already carried out. If that, so if all of that was taken and that was uh, gone through, and if there is, in the light of all of that information that members now have, if there's anything else that they see is not there, that in the next couple of weeks, that they would forward that to Shane to be included for us to consider on the 15th. Is that, could we agree that as a way forward? Agreed. Yeah. Well, yep, uh, Jim. Just on the overlap with the work that we're getting done by the independent person, there were a number of points picked up, particularly by the Green Party. Uh, could those that are relevant to that opposition issue be looked at 
in the context of the independent review? Yeah, because well, what, what we could do is we could make that available to the uh, independent, to the person who's appointed to do the review. Mm. Agreed to do that? Yes. Because mm. it would have access to the papers anyway, I would assume, but we could just make sure that is the case. Agreed? I'm not quite sure what we're agreeing to. Um, we just agree, and that basically, I think what Jim's saying is that the, the elements that are raised in relation to by the Green Party, that they, because they, they fall within the domain of the independent review, that they've been made aware that those were that was in the correspondence from the Green Party. I suppose that's really all that we're, we're saying. Yeah, fair enough. I think there's a number of the issues that are repeated, and some of them are already yes. dealt with. So yeah. I'm going to see the list. Yep. Yeah. Okay, agreed? Yep. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, members, Shane, are you happy that that's. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, and that brings us to just a couple of things to finalise. Uh, members will be. As agreed at the meeting on the 26th of February, correspondence issued to the First and Deputy First Minister requesting a meeting with the Deputy Chair and myself to discuss any suggested topics that they may have for the committee's consideration. And that to date, uh, just to inform members that a date for a meeting with the First and Deputy First Minister is yet to be confirmed, but the, but the rest of the committee will be updated once that is arranged and I assume will be the basis of what we may agree on the 15th of December. Okay, the next issue is correspondence and eight, item 8.1 correspondence from the Speaker regarding the establishment of uh, a youth assembly and that's at pages 48 to 50 uh, and that's for members to note. Okay, 8.2 correspondence from the Committee of Procedures regarding the review of standing orders 110 to 116 and that is covered in page 51 of the members pack. And is there any views on the temporary standing order which they wish to feed back to the procedures committee? And that's at page 51. Members want to just take a brief look at it for those that are maybe not on the procedures committee. I suppose she and the same thing would apply. Uh, does say in that uh, correspondence that if you can provide the views of the committee and the provisions in the standing order responses should be submitted electronically to the committee procedures, that doesn't preclude either parties or individuals to respond to that. Happy? Content? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other business? Okay, uh, no other business then. The next item is the date and time of the next meeting, which is the 15th of December, Shane. Um, that's a Tuesday. Uh, it's lunch uh, this time on a Tuesday. Would that be okay for members, Chair? Doesn't clash with the business committee. The business committee. Yes, What's it's it? usually 50, uh, 1 o'clock, which is usually done by quarter past 20 past. Yeah, Did I so 20. Yeah, 20 past, if, you, if you were content at 20 past 1. Um, Kelly, I think that usually gives us enough time. So can um, we say half? 20, 20 past one? Yeah, 20 past one. Okay. Agreed? Okay. Okay, nobody else? Members, can I just thank you for your indulgence? Very much appreciate your time, and that allows other members now to be able to go to the other committees. And thank those for who joined us from Starleaf. And apologies if I didn't maybe handle the technology as well as I should, but I think we got there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last time for the folks who took time for that meeting.